The Tom Woods Show, episode 941. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, I just returned from vacation using my favorite carry-on ever from Away. Get $20 off a suitcase for yourself by going to awaytravel.com slash woods and using promo code woods at checkout. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. If you get my newsletter, you know that I took yesterday off as a bit of a mental health day. I've been out of town for about a month and I just did not have the physical energy to put out another episode. I thought, you know, they're a very forgiving bunch, people who listen to this podcast. So that's what's going on. By the way, if you're not on my list, for heaven's sake, you get a free ebook for jumping on over at tomsfreebooks.com. Anyway, lots has been going on in the news since I've been out of town, and I'm trying to catch up with it. And I know one of the items in the news lately has been North Korea. And, you know, we have a resident expert here at the Tom Woods Show on North Korea. And that, of course, is Michael Malice, who is becoming the world's expert on North Korea. He's all over the place talking about the subject, and I'm really glad to have him here. You know, Michael is a celebrity ghostwriter, a very successful one indeed. Uh, His most recent book with D.L. Hughley hit the New York Times bestseller list, Black Man, White House. He is the author, in his own right, of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. I'm linking to that at tomwoods.com slash 941. You can find out more about Michael at michaelmalice.com. You can find him on Fox Business and Fox News regularly. What else do I want to say? Of course, he's got his own show now. He's got a brand new show, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. You're Welcome, which is the name of the show. We'll talk about that later in our conversation. Michael, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Some interesting North Korea stuff to talk about, some great Michael Malice stuff to talk about, by the way, which I guess has happened since the last time you were on. I don't think I've had an opportunity to mention it, except that I did run my episode with you on your show as an episode of mine. That's how I introduced it to folks, but not with you here with me. So I do want to talk to you about how that's been going and and the sorts of people you've been talking to. I've been following along the best I can, but then I was out of town for a few weeks, inaccessible. But I watch you on Facebook. I know what you're up to, and it's always fun. So I'm glad. You don't know what I'm up to. (laughs) But I do know that it is the year of malice. I do know that. This really is shaping up to be the year of malice. Well, let's talk about North Korea. First, um, let's be as current as possible. Today, I'm reading headlines saying that um, McMaster is giving Trump a military option in case he wants to exercise it against North Korea. So we've got that sort of tension heating up. But this very morning, you were talking with Stuart Varney on Fox Business, and you were saying, as they are indeed reporting on their website, that contrary to what the bluster might make you suspect, the North Korean government actually very much wants to avoid a military confrontation. So what makes you say that? Well, when you go to North Korea and you read their literature, they are pretty explicit about their goals and their strategies, and they make the point very clearly that they don't think they can win a military strategy. They compare themselves to an anthill fighting an elephant. Now, one of the myths that they put forward about why the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, who's Kim Jong-un's father, took over as supreme commander for the great leader, the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, they were supposedly having this big meeting with all the generals, And Kim Il-sung says, what happens if America wins? And all the generals are saying, oh, that will never happen. We'll, you know, kick their butt. That'll never happen. And the great leader says, but what if? And Kim Jong-il says, if they win, we will destroy the world. And Kim Il-sung goes, spoken like a real supreme commander. The point of this being, they know if they're going to go down, they're going to go down fighting. But they're also very well aware that if they lose, it's going to be horrific, especially because the creation myth of North Korea is that the U.S. imperialists, as we refer to, came during the Korean War, which we launched, they claim. And basically, when you had the Korean War, you had Russia, China, and North Korea in the north. You had the United States, the U.N., and South Korea in the south. And the Korean people were in the middle, and their country was devastated. So they're very much remember this as as part of their history and they know perfectly well that it would get very very ugly very very quickly and mcmaster thinks the same thing he said look when he laid out those plans for trump he says nobody wants 
the military option. Well, because of all this, I mean, there's been, uh, you know, there are other news items related to North Korea that I'll get to in a minute, but you have been all over the media talking about North Korea, and you've made multiple appearances in front of gigantic audiences. There is, ju- people can't, you know, it's what I said would happen someday. People can't get enough Michael Malice. Well, I- I'm going to correct you, and I'm going to tell you a little anecdote. This morning when I was on Stuart Varney, he said, you get more airtime than I do. And I said, well, that's because of the lapel pins. And he busted out his cufflinks, and he has American flag cufflinks, which he's worn every day since he became a U.S. citizen. And I point out to him, well, I was born in the Soviet Union, and that's why this North Korea issue matters so much to me. And he looked at me, he's like, okay, I get you. But the point is, why I wrote the book, no one knew what they were talking about with this issue. I mean, this was one of the big reasons I wrote the book. And I thought, to quote Atlas Shrugged, I'm going to put a stop to this once and for all. I'm like, someone has to be out there who's coherent, who can make this comprehensible. And the first step to defeating any enemy and to destroying you know, the most evil government on earth is to understand how they operate, their MO, their, their, their logic. And they have a perfectly coherent, perfectly evil logic to their, to their actions, which I spell out in the book, which was I was shocked to learn how explicit they were about spelling out their techniques and strategies. Yeah, so that, that does seem to be a common view of North Korea, that they're crazy. They, this regime is run by crazy people. But there's something a bit more sinister when it turns out they're not crazy. Right, and, and they're, they're twisted. And they're, the thing is, if they're crazy, to be crazy means to act in defiance of reality, to act not in contact with reality. If you're not in contact with reality, reality is going to be in contact with you. It's going to catch up with you sooner or later. You're not going to be able to make something last for 70 years under a complete system that does not bear the facts of reality into account. So they are bright. They are conniving. They regard human life as having no value. And they practice what they preach, which is, has caused the country to be turned into basically a lunatic asylum in a prison camp. Well, let's talk about uh, this item that I just saw today. In fact, it's dated today from UPI. North Korea drought mobilizes workers to fight drought, bans travel. And as I scroll down, I read that uh, that the ban on movement began in April, uh, that people, uh, they're closing down marketplaces early, they're restricting movement, they're forcing people to do work uh, relating to drought. What do you know about this? And does it seem that, he asks rhetorically, in communist countries, there seems to be more difficulty with drought and more difficulty coping with the weather? Bad weather is always an excuse. And when the famine hit in the 90s, North Korea was hit with some of the worst storms they'd ever seen two years in a row, or at least two years in a row, which was, of course, you know, the reason for the crop failing as opposed to, I don't know, refusing to allow the UN to give food to the people. Um, So an interesting point is one of the things I always stress when I talk about North Korea is how normal and human these poor people are. And I don't mean poor in the sense of just financially poor. I mean poor in the sense that they truly are victims of a despicable autocratic regime. And my guide, you know, when you have a guide in North Korea, they're very, very, very high class, very wealthy, very high status, right? Which meant she dressed in 80s clothes because that's as nice as you're going to get in North Korea. And my guy, you know, young woman, she pointed out that once a year, they make everyone in North Korea go into the countryside and harvest rice. And me being kind of collegial and friendly, I'm like, oh, that sounds very nice, you know, you know, kind of like some hands across America thing, which some people can remember when you and I were young. And she looks at me, she's like, yeah. And then you realize, you know what, despite all the propaganda and the side of things she taught in school, this is a bourgeois, wealthy city dweller who has to get in the muck once a year. Uh, and, and like a farmhand, and to her, it's as low as it gets. So they very much are motivated by the same human impulses that everyone else is. And that, to me, is a big sign of hope that when the regime comes down, it will not take that much to have these people have a normal functioning society. I read a book uh, probably when I was in college by a guy named Hedrick Smith, and he, he had written a book called I think he'd written a book called The Russians in years past, but then he'd written a book called The New Russians, where I think he had gone there either in the late 80s or early 90s. 
And if I'm remembering this, if I'm remembering this particular book correctly, he was suggesting that the communist experience had left a deep and profound imprint on the Russian public that was that he did not see as being easily reversed. Like, for instance, in the U.S., well, less so today, but when he wrote, certainly, if you would see somebody in a fancy car, well, you might say, oh, well, you know, you know what, if I save up, maybe I'll have that car someday. Whereas he said, in, in Russia, you don't see that among the public. You, you, you see instead this attitude of, I'd like to kill that guy who has that car. And he says, that is a product of basically associating success with cronyism, because anybody who's doing well around here must have some connection. And so it makes you disparage success in general. So, do you think that's true about Russia? And if so, why would that not be a problem in North Korea? Well, let me break this down. So first of all, Russians have jokes about new Russians. So this is like a comedic trope where you make fun of them because the idea is that they're very flashy and flamboyant and kind of trashy, kind of like the new rich in America. So that's very much something in the Russian consciousness. But the question that has always happened vis-a-vis Russia is, did communism cause this or was it the character of the Russian people that allowed communism to take root there? It's a chicken and the egg situation. So there always has been historically a dark cynicism to the Russian spirit. This is not you know, a controversial statement to make. So it's not surprising that you would see this kind of outcome. Like the, the Russian belief is very much the idea that aspiration and hope is a fool's gambit. And you should really, you know, get your eyes off the stars and just focus on getting through it. And it's a very, very dark worldview, which I've spent my entire life in complete opposition to. But as of, regarding North Korea, I think it's a different situation because now they're getting food through entrepreneurialism. The government's not providing food, so they're doing it through black markets. And you know what? Honestly, if we come to a point where North Korea is free, but they have contempt for the people driving Ferraris, I'm fine with that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, obviously, let's get these people fed. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, worse things could happen than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, more stuff to talk about with Michael Malice in North Korea after we thank our sponsor. Hey, everybody, I just returned from being away for nearly a month, and I used the most awesome carry-on I've ever had before during this trip. It's an away carry-on. It comes in two sizes, and I'll tell you, This thing made me the king of the airport. I think I told you before, I have USB ports built into my carry-on. Yeah, that's right. So I'm sitting there charging my phone, which I can charge five times on one charge of the suitcase, just sitting there in the airport. I'm charging my phone with my suitcase. Yes, I am the king of the airport as a result of this thing. They've got nine colors and four sizes of suitcases, the away people. You got the 360 degree spinner wheels. You got the combination lock. You got a removable and washable laundry bag so you can keep dirty clothes separate from clean. It's very strong, impact resistant, very lightweight also. And you get a hundred day trial with it. Why would you need a hundred days? After two days, you're going to say this is the best thing ever. And if you want a great travel experience, then check out an away carry on. And as a matter of fact, because you listen to this show, you can get $20 off. Just head over to awaytravel.com slash woods and use woods at checkout. That's right. Woods is your promo code. Go to awaytravel.com slash woods and use woods as your promo code and take 20 smackers off one of their awesome suitcases. All right, let's talk about uh, this case of this American who'd been imprisoned in North Korea and who recently died, because this, of course, has also generated a lot of attention for the, uh, you know, to North Korea. People are talking about this particular episode. So tell me, how did he come to be imprisoned there, and what were the circumstances of his death? I, you know, I got to tell you, just I'm going to make a broader point about Otto Wambir, that student, which is whenever something happens to any American anywhere, you have the neocons saber rattling and being like, this can never pass. Let's have war today. But in fact, every appearance I've been making discussing this, the hosts who I've talked to and the audience have been extremely receptive to my message. So I'm glad to be able to be a small voice of reason on this issue. Otto Wambir was a college student. He took a tour to North Korea. He stayed in the same hotel I stayed at when I was there. He stayed on the same floor I was at when I was there. You were segregated by nationality in that hotel. And what he did supposedly is he trespassed 
to a floor you're not allowed to go to, which I was tempted to do because I, you know, when, before I went, I Googled about this trip and there's some blog I saw that says, hey, there's this secret floor. So there were a few people many times over the years who go to the secret floor. And uh, supposedly he took one of their posters. Now, did this person deserve to be murdered? Absolutely not. However, if you go to the White House and you trespass and you try to steal Hillary Clinton's painting, it's not going to end well for you. You're going to be arrested. You are going to have to deal with consequences. But what they do is when North Korea captures people as a hostage, they're just looking for a pretense because they, can't, they, they don't want to be able to took someone for no reason. Now they have a reason and now they have a bargaining chip. They claim he was in a coma for 10 months, which is absurd because they don't have the medical care for that. So basically what happened is they, in my view, they had a hostage. Things started turning bad. They're like, crap, quick, let's get rid of this body. They got him on a plane and he, you know, passed away here. And, and the thing that I want to point out that I haven't seen mentioned in the press is that poor mom, because you know that she sat him down before he got on this trip and said, don't do it. This is a mistake. And yeah. she's going to have that guilt for the rest of her life. Yeah. So my heart really, really goes out to her. Oh, yeah, yeah. I should have stopped him. Right. I should have tried harder to persuade him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that really is crushing. But uh, it's true that, of course, uh, it, it wouldn't end well for you if you did something similar here in the U.S. But uh, obviously it would end a lot better. Correct. Uh, you wouldn't die of unknown causes after being, you know, in a barely in a state of wakefulness. Uh, when returned to your parents? Well, one big theory is that he committed self-harm because the doctors didn't find any evidence of trauma. Like, so he was first sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. And I said at the time that that's a lie for several reasons. First of all, you want the hostage returned in good shape. None of the people that North Korea has held captive over the years from America ever served hard labor, number one. Number two is if he gets sent to these labor camps, he is a Western eyewitness to their atrocities. So either he dies in the camps, which they can't have, or he's released and he gets to testify in front of the UN what the conditions are like, which they can't have either. That's a great point. So what is the goal? And hard labor, how much you know, value is he going to be producing with his work? Very, very little. So everyone they held captive points out that they're treated very well uh, by North Korean standards, of course, that, you know, which is hardly the Hilton. And the guards often you know, develop relationships with these prisoners because this is their only window to the outside world so when you have a hostage and again these are rational actors you want that person kept in good shape so that you get the money or whatever it is you're looking for in exchange yeah that is man that is such a it's kind of obvious when you put it that way but i hadn't quite thought of it and here's the other thing when he got caught at that floor in that hidden floor whoever saw him in America, maybe someone could, some guard could be like, okay, I'm going to look the other way. North Korea is a surveillance society where everyone watches everyone else. If I'm a North Korean guard and I see malfeasance on the part of a tourist, I have to report him or else I'm going to be in real trouble. Right. Now, but, but let me back up, though. I want to make sure, I want to get your thoughts, though, on this question of um, the professor, I guess, at the University of Delaware. Right. She was part time and she apparently on Facebook and then it got circulated all over the place, said that he more or less got what he deserved. He was one of these uh, entitled, uh, privileged white guys who just thinks he can do what he wants and not face any consequences. And that was her response to, you know, the death of somebody's child, basically. And she wound up getting fired. And now I'm not, you know, it's it's whatever university policy they want to have with these professors, you know, do what you want to do. But for one thing, as, as I've seen people say, if you are a part-time professor, don't say something like that because you are so expendable when the public relations winds blow the other way. You will be gone in 10 seconds. And if you think that the sisterhood of feminism is going to defend you, if it means that their budget is threatened, bye-bye. You're dispensable. It was a dumb thing to do apart from kind of evil. Well... Is there any possibility this woman knew anything about Otto Wambier other than he was a white male college student? She had no insight into his background. She knew nothing about him other, other than that. And just based on that, she's being flippant and glib. And I'm sorry. If, if, I mean, even if he didn't die, even if he was just spending 15 years hard labor, I don't agree. Let's suppose it's true. Let's suppose he is obnoxious, entitled, 
college student, and I've seen plenty in my day, went to Bucknell, there was full of them. The idea that any of them should be sentenced to 15 years hard labor for trespassing and stealing a poster is psychotic. Yeah, well, that goes without saying. Well, apparently so, not. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it goes without saying with normal people, right? But, right. but you know, American academics, uh, you know, who, who knows what, what they would say. Uh, there have been, has there been at least one other celebrity visit? Was it, who was it who went and visited? Did Dennis Rodman go and visit Correct. recently North Korea? Correct. Okay, whatever, what came of that? And was there any point to it other than, I mean, what, what do you think the deal is with that? He was there promoting a cryptocurrency which got a great deal of publicity from this trip, whose name I will not repeat. And it's very, very sad that this currency is going to exploit this nation full of children who are starved for political purposes just to sell you know, their product. Uh, you know, Dennis Rodman is an idiot. When Dennis Rodman was on Sunday morning sh- some Sunday morning show, he was asked, hey, what about their concentration camps? And he, his response was, we have prisons, what's the difference? Oh! Yeah. So you ask any prisoner in North Korea or any American prisoner, hey, you guys want to do a swap? It's not going to be a very hard question. They'll be glad to tell you what the differences are. Yeah. So it's, it's uncon- he's, just a, he's just an idiot. And to their credit, the media did not give him as much attention as they had in the past. In the past, it was a spectacle, and you can understand that because this is the one guy who's going to be talking to Kim Jong-un from the West. And now I think there's an understanding of, wait a minute, this is unusual and bizarre, but this isn't really that funny uh, in the sense that like, let, let's just take a step back and think, you know, what, what we're carnivalizing. And this is just terrific. And, and again, I've been speaking out a lot about the idea of stop viewing them as a sideshow and start viewing them as a, you know, butcher house or an abattoir. And I think that's really, really started to sink in with the press. And if I could take a little bit of credit for that, I will. Well, let me ask you, let me just ask you one more quick thing. I mean, you, you are in crazy demand and I'm so, I couldn't be happier about it because I want people to listen to you more than anybody else on almost anything. Now, not quite everything because you are dead wrong. Especially Hamilton. Things. Well, <laughs> we're, that's not even going to be discussed. Although, you know, we were on St. Kitts and it was, it's their sister island where he was uh, born. And yeah. if we'd been able to get over there to his birthplace, if it's, it's, if it's marked in any way, I would have done it. Awesome. There was just no time, unfortunately, to make that happen. But anyway, has, have you ever been there? I've not. No. Okay. All right. Cause then that, that would have been the ultimate coup. All right. Next, next Caribbean trip. I'm going to, Sneak that in there. All right. Anyway, Croy. But anyway, what was it I wanted to say about? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So we've got um, at this point Trump having promised. Uh, okay, we all know campaign promises, right? But on the campaign trail, he had some kind of plan that to eliminate ISIS in thirty days, and then he then he then he laid down the law with North Korea. You know, no more launches, and there have obviously been subsequent launches. Right. At some point. Is there a possibility that he just lashes out and says, well, look, I got to deliver on something and maybe it winds up being North Korea because they keep, well, I mean, you know, if he says don't launch and they launch, something's got to give here. Well, look at, look what he's doing. Let's suppose, Tom, you and I had a feud, right? And I go on my Facebook and on this day I'm meeting with that sibling who you hate. And the next day I'm meeting with that professor you had a rivalry with. And the next day, I'm, I'm meeting with a former co-worker who thinks you're the pits. And, so, and I'm just putting this up on my Facebook. You're, be, you're going to get a message, you know, that I'm colluding with all your foes and something's up. And it's going to get, get into your head, whether you like it or not. And that's exactly what he's doing. He had the Chinese president come in Mar-a-Lago, and they very publicly said we discussed North Korea. The Japanese prime minister came. Tomorrow, he's meeting with the South Korean president. So, and they're all explicitly saying we're discussing North Korea. Now, if every country surrounding you is sitting down with your arch enemy America and they're talking about you, that is going to make you, as North Korea, very nervous. And that's very smart on his approach. And we can see the paranoia because Kim Jong-un killed his older brother, Kim Jong-nam, who is the only real eligible successor to him if something happened to him. So he's clearly freaking out about his hold on power. And you can't blame him. He's like in his early 30s. The idea that, any, first of all, no one can govern a country. Think, we know this because of Mises' economic calculation issue. But when you're in your 30s, you can barely get dressed. 
So, you know, you can't blame this kid for being terrified, and he should be terrified, because this, to me, if the, if the North Korean regime was going to end, this is what the beginning of the end would look like. Huh. Very, very interesting. Well, I, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time here to talk about your new show. Michael Malice has, I mean, I told you it's the year of malice. Can you believe Michael Malice now hosts his own show that we get to live in that world? That world is now. So what's the name of the show? Of course, look, if people are longtime listeners or even just for a few weeks, I took our episode together where I was your first guest and I made an episode of this show hoping to give you a little bit of a bump. Um, whatever Tom Wood show bump there is, yeah. but tell people exactly uh, what the show is and what it's all about and then how they can watch it. Well, the show's called You're Welcome. It's on compoundmedia.com, which is run by Anthony, formerly of Opie and Anthony, the two shock jocks. So I've kind of been playing it by ear. I had you as my guest, then Pax Dickinson, who's a big troll. Uh, I had a 4chan mod, um, you know, just yesterday. And my buddy, Tom Shalou, who is the host of Red Eye, I've got some other cool people coming up. But it's, it's very interesting, as you know, going from being guest to host. And the more, the more I'm doing it, the faster the time is flying, and I'm really uh, having fun with it. Yeah, I, absolutely. I watched the Pax Dickinson one, uh, and I enjoyed that. And I actually felt like, darn, that was a lot more fun than I gave malice on on our thing i should have been more fun <laughs> well, but we we were more cerebral and yeah i know is, but, is but right but i was thinking maybe that was i maybe i was i was reproaching myself that you oh, know, maybe please. i should have been more but 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 anyway it was i mean i thoroughly enjoyed it and i was really glad to be there and it was really neat that two of my daughters were there for that and yeah. later on of course they will appreciate the historic significance of that moment but but all the same it was it was good to have them so compound media and, and they did and they did chastise us for our language. <laughs> our language, right. Yeah, well, it was your language. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But it was just, it was, yeah, it was under your influence. But anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're welcome. This, this, yeah, this is neither here nor there. But people should go to <laughs> compoundmedia.com, which, by the way, I subscribe to because I wanted to watch Dave Smith fill in for Gavin, I think, one day. Yeah. And then I just never unsubscribed. So, you know, I, once I subscribe to something for seven bucks a month, I, pr- I it, it would it, like it's it's worth more. It would take more than seven bucks to get me to bother to go unsubscribe. So I'll just go ahead. Keep taking my it doesn't matter. It's not worth it to me. Well, but now I, now I got Michael Malice, though. Well, here's my thinking. People are like, oh, I can't believe it's behind a paywall. Well, it's Anthony's network. So that's his choice. Number one. Number two is there's a bunch of different shows you can watch and they're all archived. And most importantly, pretend it's a Patreon and you're contributing $7 a month to the Malice Fund. Yeah, I mean, that, that's when you exactly put in that right. terms, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, big, de- yeah, yeah, yeah. No, anybody who complains about paywalls, I mean, they can complain like from a strategic point of view. They say, well, maybe you'd get more listeners. Yeah, okay, but, sure. right, but you're not the owner, so it's not ultimate. We appreciate your opinion. We'll file it away. But there are different models out there and, and they, you know, a pay model works for a lot of people. And, you know, let's, yeah. a lot of variety makes the world go round. So uh, I, I hope it's super successful for you. Oh, I'm having a blast. Yeah. I, and, and uh, I, I, look, I, I'm, I'm more than getting my money's worth. But I mean, if, if anything, I owe you, right? <laughs> I'll see you in court. <laughs> well, in fact, you remember that? That's a great, one of my favorite Simpsons moments is the comic book guy complaining about the worst episode ever. And then they say, yes. and, 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 and they're asking about how, you know, what on earth grounds he could have for complaining. He says, well, as a longtime viewer, I feel they owe me. And of course, their correct response is, wait a minute, what could they possibly owe you after giving you hundreds of hours of free entertainment? And then all he could say was, worst episode ever. Do you know that was based on an actual uh, Usenet post? I didn't know that. See, I get all the inside scoop when I get you on. I didn't know that. Yeah, I used to be back in the 90s on alt.tv.simpsons. And someone had this whole post, like last night's episode was just the worst episode ever. I mean, and they, they tore it apart. And that inspired um, the Simpsons writers to have that whole sequence. Wow, that is great. Yeah. Yeah, because, and, and man, those people deserved 
<laughs> so anyway, well, thankfully, I haven't had anybody so far. Even even if I occasionally have a clunker of an episode, people are so kind about it. You know, they they try to blame it on the guest. You know, there's always <laughs> some reason that it's not Woods's fault. I, I have the most charitable listening audience in the world <laughs> most of the time. That's very sweet. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, great. Listen, Michael also, not only does he have his own show now, uh, which is You're Welcome, which, and I'm going to link to it, by the way, uh, direct link over at uh, tomwoods.com slash 941. But he's also joining me for my episode number 1000 extravaganza in Orlando, September 9th. Of course, Michael hardly needs any reason to come to Orlando because you know Michael Malice and attractions in Orlando. I mean, that's the, the, the two go together like chocolate and vanilla ice cream, right? <laughs> and the sushi. <laughs> and the sushi. Oh man, oh man, but he's doing it as a favor. <laughs> and and I'm I'm it's going to be really exciting. So make sure and sign up at tomwoods.com/orlando for that free event and Michael, thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom. All right, before I let you go, yes, that's right. We got more websites created by listeners of the show. And guess what? This one is called thedogloversofamerica.com. So you know, you're either going to love this site or not love it depends on your opinion on dogs. The site, I love it. I love the way it's laid out. It's got all kinds of interesting tips and information, questions that you might have that you're not even sure other people have, and yet there they are. Yeah, I wonder, what what do you do about this, or how do you handle that? Um, He's even got a free ebook called Simple Dog Training when you sign up for his newsletter. But all kinds of great stuff, ranging from product reviews or tips and tricks for dog owners and dog lovers, um, Tremendous. You're going to love it. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. It's thedogloversofamerica.com. Great. This is exactly how to set up a niche site. It's, it's, it's got a lot of great information. People would want to go to it. And it's got products that people actually would want to use. And it's got reviews of them. Perfect. Perfectly done. If you want to set up a niche site, go do this. Do what you see here. This is how you should do it at thedogloversofamerica.com. We're linking to that at tomwoods.com slash 941 as the listener website mentioned. If you want to get a shout out for that website that is but a twinkle in your eye at the moment, then check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. And you'll see if you get your hosting through my link, you get publicity from me and numerous other goodies. They're going to help give you a great start out of the gate. So tomwoods.com slash publicity is how you can find out more about that. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.